Hello everyone, I'm Professor Geek. Welcome back to my channel. And welcome to the first installment of my Stop Screwing with the Costume series. As promised, this video will deal with Wonder Woman and the changes that have been forced on her costume and character design. I'm sticking mostly to mainline continuity, but first I want to reiterate that I will be pointing out the differences between organic costume evolution and those forced changes. So let me define what I mean by that first. Wonder Woman was initially designed by Marston and Peters with a short skirt. That skirt eventually became a pair of tight shorts, and then the briefs, and then almost more like bikini bottoms at times, and so forth. All of these changes are organic, though I feel some of the skimpier bikini designs do cross the line into the unnecessary. But Marston designed Wonder Woman's costume to show off her body, and to be scandalous in some measure. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that she is supposed to be objectified or reduced to a sex object or anything like that. Click the link in the top right hand corner for a video on the delicate balance of Jungian psychology that went into the character's creation. But Marston created Wonder Woman to be beautiful as Aphrodite, wise as Athena, swifter than Hermes, and stronger than Hercules. Beautiful as Aphrodite, not beautiful as Artemis or Athena or some strong independent warrior woman. Diana is a strong and independent warrior, but that's not all she is. She's also as beautiful as Aphrodite, the sexually alluring and often vain goddess of erotic love. This isn't to say that Diana is vain, but that's the type of beauty she has. She should be sexually attractive, which does not have to mean being reduced to a sex object. Many proponents of a third-wave feminist mindset, though, can't accept this beautiful as Aphrodite part. They want to change that core aspect of the character, and the bottom half of Wonder Woman's costume is a great example. The short skirt Marston and Peters initially put her in was scandalous to American society at the time. Scandalous, though, because it showed more skin than was socially acceptable. Not that she was exuding sexuality through it or anything, but simply because it showed too much skin. So as society's norms changed, the skirt changed to fulfill the same function. From a cultural perspective, once a shorter skirt was no longer a big deal, the skirt became skin-tight shorts. Then the briefs design, and so on. These are changes that help the costume fulfill its purpose of calling attention to Diana's beauty of Aphrodite. Her feats of strength and speed speak for themselves, and so should her beauty. It shouldn't be covered or played down. The first and detrimental change to her costume came of course in the 60s and the Diana Prince secret agent era. Tons of videos and articles and books have been made and written about that, but just to sum up here, the great Dennis O'Neill had what he later admitted was a misguided notion that women needed to see a strong, independent woman like themselves who didn't have superpowers and didn't parade around in a costume that showed off her body. So Diana gave up her powers, costume, and title and became a secret agent type character. The backlash was huge. Gloria Steinem perhaps expressed it best when she said that Wonder Woman had served as a little girl's Superman. Here was a woman who could hold her own alongside the male superheroes in comics, and she was an important metaphor and inspiration and so on. Wonder Woman was eventually restored, but I want to talk a little bit more about that costume change. If you read through some of those issues of Diana Prince, you'll find that the character and subject matter is much more sexualized than when she had her costume, almost as if the artists were somehow compensating. The nature of comics as a visual fantasy medium is to show us highly idealized male and female forms. No one wants to see Superman fight crime with a beer gut, or Wonder Woman catch bank robbers in a sweatsuit. So Wonder Woman regained her powers and costume, and they remained until 2011 when writer J. Michael Straczynski took over the run. He and artist Jim Lee redesigned the character's costume and backstory in what proved to be a temporary arc, but was promoted at least as a permanent change to the character. Along with changes to her backstory, they completely redesigned her costume with pants, a top with straps, and Jim Lee's signature 90s style jacket. Straczynski justified this by arguing that both Batman and Superman had changed their costume over the years, and Wonder Woman should be allowed to accessorize. It's hard to believe that such a talented writer and someone so knowledgeable about mythology could make such an ignorant statement. Until the New 52, Batman and Superman had not changed any of the essentials of their costumes. We'll explore those in later episodes. And furthermore, Wonder Woman and her colleagues are icons, not fashionistas. You don't dress a Virgin Mary statue in Vera Wang. You don't paint George Washington in Armani. Icons are timeless and speak to the ages through the form in which they initially entered into the public consciousness. Straczynski said they designed her as though she was a new character, with no history. And they achieved their goal, for the costume design spoke of nothing that Wonder Woman stood for. After a failed attempt by the New 52 to keep the pants, they settled for muted colors and made the sword Wonder Woman's go-to weapon. 
Later in the DCU initiative, pants were added again, as well as extra armor and weapons. Then in the DC Rebirth, Wonder Woman lined up with the costume design that Zack Snyder had chosen for her in the Batman v Superman film, a Xeno Warrior Princess-like costume inspired by Greek warriors. In the comics, at least this costume is brightly colored, but it is still a far cry from the design that speaks to who Wonder Woman is and why her character persists. So now that I've got the history out of the way, what is the costume design that writers, artists, and filmmakers need to stop screwing with? We've covered the skirt to shorts to briefs. Artists can play with such versions within those parameters, though I will argue that the briefs resonate the most on a symbolic note because of the V shape in the front. V has long been a symbol of femininity in the history of art and mythology. V for vagina, V for virginity, the feminine V. I'm not making this stuff up. This is the original icon for male. It's a rudimentary phallus. Quite to the point. Yes, indeed. This is known as the blade. It represents aggression and manhood. It's a symbol still used today in modern military uniforms. Yes, the more penises you have, the higher your rank boys will be boys. Now, as you would imagine, the female symbol is its exact opposite. This is called the chalice. And the chalice resembles a cup or vessel, or more importantly, the shape of a woman's womb. No, the grail. The bottoms also need to be blue with white stars, not black not without stars. Wonder Woman was created to be an Amazonian ambassador to man's world via the United States of America, no matter how much that chafes later writers and editors who desperately try to wiggle out of the stipulation. Wonder Woman drapes herself in a flag design to call attention to the virtues and values the United States has in common with ancient Greek culture, and to call us to an even higher standard through them. Now what about the torso? It should be red, and yes, it should have the sweetheart neckline bustier, Red for the colors of the flag, and love, passion, power, etc. The sweetheart cut is for a number of reasons. For one, it resembles the top of a heart. These subtle shape details are important, like the inverse cut on Superman's boots that form an M. When done correctly, his costume tells us he's super, with the S-shield on his chest, but just importantly, if not more so, that he identifies as one of us, a man, with the M on his boots. He's literally grounded by his humanity. For Wonder Woman, the heart shape, made complete when paired with the V-shaped briefs on the bottom, reminds us that Marston created Wonder Woman to embody love allure. See that previous video I mentioned for details. She's not some barbarian warrior, and her battle skills do not define her. It is her compassion, empathy, understanding, her heart that draws us to her. Atop the bustier can either be a gold eagle or the gold W. Like the briefs, though, I heavily prefer the eagle that can double as a W. It ties her costume to Greek mythology, as the eagle is a symbol for Zeus, and it deepens the connection between her culture and the United States, which also takes the eagle for its symbol. Now you might have noticed I've been calling the top a bustier, not just a top, because it really should be a bustier. It shouldn't be obscene or anything, but like the short skirt or briefs, it should highlight Wonder Woman's distinctly feminine beauty. The breasts are also highly symbolic, symbolizing the nurturing nature of the divine feminine. We're so used to sexualizing the sight of breasts in our culture that we often miss their symbolic significance. So let me say the outrageous statement and then deal with the inevitable backlash. Wonder Woman should be curvy and obviously feminine. I don't mean exaggerated beyond normal comic standards, but let's just be specific. She should have accentuated breasts and hips. I can feel the outrage brewing at this point. Wonder Woman represents all women, not just the hourglass figures, etc, etc, etc. Wonder Woman, though, is not a person. She's not a political activist, no matter how hard people try to make her one. Wonder Woman is a mythological icon. She operates most effectively and profoundly when abiding by the rules of icons. Look up statues and paintings of goddesses from antiquity. Cultural standards of beauty change, and women come in all shapes and sizes, but so long as babies are birthed between hips and nursed at the breast, those two parts of the body hold distinctly feminine significance. Look up ancient renderings of the Venus of Willendorf, or Aphrodite. Even in the long and thin figures of ancient Egyptian art, Hathor stands out with accentuated curves. So the top and bottom of the costume should highlight the feminine. But what about the boots, bracelet, and tiara? The boots should be red. The New 52 tried to make them black or dark blue, but it hurts the color balance of the costume and removes the visual link to Superman. 
long before Supergirl, Wonder Woman was the only female to stand alongside Superman in power. She shares his values and in many ways is the feminine counterpart to his masculine hero. In this regard, I prefer the white stripe on her red boots too, representing the pure, distinctly feminine energy that she brings to the archetype. For the bracelets, the important thing to remember is that like the whole of the uniform we'll speak about in a moment, they are not armor. Wonder Woman uses them as a type of armor to deflect bullets, yes, but that's only poignant if the bracelets themselves are a symbol of captivity. They are called the Bracelets of Submission, and they're the perfect picture of the love allure Marston created Wonder Woman to represent. They symbolize the Amazon's submission to Aphrodite and the other patrons, and they are a reminder of when they once gave their power away submitting to men. When they use their bonds for defense in battle, it's a symbol of conquest through loving submission. As such, the bracelets work best, I think, as plain silver. That's not an absolute deal-breaker. Linda Carter herself had a red star on hers. You might be able to argue that designs and adornments are a reappropriation and empowerment of their past subjugation, but I tend to favor the power of simplicity when it comes to symbolism. Like the bracelets, the tiara should not be treated as armor either. Attempts to make it a glorified nose guard are just plain silly. The shape has been altered a bit here and there, sometimes pointing down instead of up. That's not an absolute deal breaker either, but I do think that Tiara should look as much like a proper Tiara as possible. She's a princess, and it's her crown. The red star is a small but important symbol as well. Red is her love allure, and not only does the color cover her heart, but it's also stamped upon her mind. As a side note, can writers and editors stop pretending that it's not a boomerang as well? That's symbolic, too, in that she uses her royal heritage on the field in her mission as Wonder Woman. She should have a belt to break up the red and blue of top and bottom, and that has been either white or gold at times, though I prefer the gold. That's not a hard and fast rule, either. So let's wrap this up by examining the current treatment of Wonder Woman's costume. When DC realized the New 52 was driving their universe and sales to a certain death, they announced the Rebirth Initiative. They infused heart back into the universe, setting their characters on a path back to their iconic status. Many of the costumes were set on the same path. Superman's, for example, regained many iconic touches, and now in Action Comics 1000 will even have his trunks return. Wonder Woman's costume, however, became a copy of the design the current films are using. Her few moments of screen time in Batman v Superman had been one of the high points for a lot of people, so I imagine the mandate came down from on high to sync up her character with the films as much as possible. Thankfully, Greg Rucka didn't listen to the mandate to the letter. The Rebirth Wonder Woman's personality is far more aligned with her iconic tradition than in the film's version. But the suit is the same armor-plated ensemble, complete with ubiquitous sword and shield. Armor is not off the table for Wonder Woman, nor is a sword or any weaponry that she would have been trained to wield as an Amazon. But when you make her full-time costume a suit of armor, and her full-time weapon a sword, you make her a full-time warrior. And that is a gross reduction of Wonder Woman. Fiction abounds, especially today, with badass warrior women. But Wonder Woman has always been special. It's not enough to simply say she's more than a she-warrior. Her stories have to show it, and not just in a few scenes, but in each layer of her character. Wonder Woman does not come to America covered in armor, shielding herself, and with a sword ready to attack. She comes in a costume that reveals herself to the outside world. She has nothing to hide, and her go-to weapon is a lasso, which, like the bracelets and tiara, serves a double purpose as a tool to both forcibly subdue and evoke willing submission. Wonder Woman can wear armor when necessary, or a dress, or a pantsuit, or whatever, and she can swing a sword, throw a spear, or shoot a bow when the story might call for it, but her go-to gear, the apparel and weaponry she should be most associated with, holds profound symbolic and cultural significance. Alter even a small portion of it long enough, and the core of the character begins to change. The New 52 Wonder Woman, for example, with her darker colors and sword in hand, became bloodthirsty, bragging about killing her enemies so that they would not return. A far cry from who Wonder Woman should be. DC has been obsessed with redesigning costumes. Every year they feel they need to tweak this or that, but these characters and their costumes have remained relatively consistent for decades as they seeped into the public consciousness before these changes. They are not irrelevant, they've never needed to be updated, it only hurts the characters in the end. So stop screwing with the costumes. I realized while editing this video that many of the images here and there feature a cape. The cape is pretty much just an adornment. She rarely ever wears it in battle, at least long term. You might see this scene or that scene in this title or that title. 
the cape is really just optional. It, it's almost a a coat or a cloak that she might take with her at times. I know that cosplayers often will wear a cape if they are doing charity events for children or something of that nature and feel that traditional Wonder Woman costume might be a little bit much when they're bending over and dealing with children, so it's often a choice in that scenario. At times it can be used in the comics for more of a ceremonial look or bringing an added nobility to the costume, but it really is optional so long as it's not overused. That's all for this installment of the series. If you liked it, leave a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe and share, and let me know who you would like to see me focus on in the next Stop Screwing with the Costume video. I've covered Superman pretty well before beginning this series, but there are plenty more characters out there who've been monkeyed with for far too long by redesigning artists and editors. So let me know your votes on who should be next, and until next time, keep enjoying and digging deeper into the superhero stories you love.